Today on Monkey Life, Marmoset Queenie gets a visit from an old friend. You're a good girl, aren't you? And is happy to say hello. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. She looks so content and happy. Jeremy turns inventor to encourage his old friend, Orangutan Amy, off the ground. Come on, Amy, get up there. But gets the brush off. Don't give me that look. I divorced you a long time ago. And woolly monkey Pichua takes her time deciding if she wants to be friends with impressive male Levar. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. Everybody's well aware that they need to be looked after carefully. They should be OK. The park provides a home for more than 260 monkeys and apes from 24 different species. Over the past seven months, the primate care team have undertaken a complicated and complex shake-up of the woolly monkey groups, due in part to the number of male woolies at the park. It's involved moving numerous individuals and led to the setting up of Monkey World's first all-male bachelor woolly group. It's been a challenging time, but was essential in order to keep the monkeys' stress levels down and keep them healthy. Introductions can be a little bit stressful because it does mean having to split up the groups. We try and sort of push these intros on nice and smoothly so that it's not interfering with their sort of dynamics too much. So getting them all together, you know, is, is really important. Today marks an important milestone, the final piece of the puzzle. Pichua, a 10-year-old female recently rehomed from Gaia Zoo in the Netherlands, is about to become a full-time member of Levar's troop at the Top Woolies. But to complicate things a little further, Zingu, the dominant female of the group, has just given birth. We've kind of been waiting sort of for the past, past few weeks. Every week is probably going to be this week and just kind of waiting and waiting, but not trying to sort of hold off too much on all the other things that we've needed to do. Um, quite a big baby, sort of, yeah, and looks very, very strong and healthy. Um, her two daughters, Olivia and Layla, are very interested. So Zinga's been letting them come over and say hello, but she's just taken it in her stride. She's a fantastic mum, so she's doing really well. And yeah, he seems quite sort of, sort of alert and, and confident and quite advanced already for such a, a little thing. It's not just the newborn infant and Pichua who are going to have to get used to new surroundings. Completing the picture, female Isla is going to be let outside for the first time with Enzo's group at the Pond Woolies. Good girl. It's going to be a busy morning for the team. Starting with Pichua, who's in a travel box on her way to Lavar's house. Good girl. Once inside, she'll be given a bit of time to get used to her new surroundings before being introduced to the big man himself. It's going to be a much more natural kind of home environment for her, a nice, a strong social structure, um, really nice group of monkeys. So, yeah, we're really excited to just kind of see how the introductions go. And, yeah, we've got real a lot of optimism and how she's going to settle in with, with this group. With Pichua in place, some of the team head over to the Pond Woolies, to open the slides to their outdoor enclosure. They're hoping Isla will follow the group through the long tunnel connecting the house to their magnificent tree-filled space. New boss Enzo leads the way. Making up the group are Pakaya and her two daughters, Oriana, and the youngest member, Enya. They're an incredibly close-knit family who have a very strong relationship with Enzo. Time will tell if Isla can fit in and develop the same affinity. The group make contact calls to encourage her. And after a few minutes, Isla makes the journey across to the large outdoor enclosure. 
She was really brave. She was quite excited, I think, just this big open space. She went straight up, up onto the high beams, exploring through the trees. Quite impressive for her first day. She was quite bold. Um, and she seems to be really enjoying that space and being a woolly monkey, really enjoying those higher up areas. So yeah, I think it's, it's been a really successful first day. While Isla settles in and gets to know her new home, back at the top woolies, Pichua is about to come face to face with the new man in her life. Kind and gentle giant, Lavar. They're meeting in one of the bedrooms and Lavar greets his new lady with an impressive display. Pichua isn't phased by the male bravado, but keeps her distance, while Lavar does his best to show off. It's early days, but after months of planning, countless moves, and complex introductions, the park's four woolly groups are complete, which will help all 24 woolies at the park lead happy and healthy lives. It's not just the woolly monkey residents whose lives and circumstances have changed recently. It's been eight months since common marmoset Queenie left her life as a pet trade animal to live with others of her own kind at the park. The care team introduced her to a number of other marmosets, both male and female, with varying results. But now they think they've found the perfect combination. Queenie's now really settled. Um, she's living in the squirrel monkey house, not with the squirrel monkeys. She's actually living with a male marmoset called Mickey, and they're getting on really, really well. She actually seems a little bit dominant over him, um, which is nice, but they, they groom, they, uh, they interact, they bed down together, um, so they're getting on really well, and it's, it's really nice to see. Today, Queenie is having visitors. Her previous owners, who asked Alison to rehome her, have arrived and are keen to see how well she's settled in. Jill and her husband Chris did everything possible to cater for her needs. But they realised that what Queenie needed most was companionship of her own kind. Hey, missus. You want to come down here? Come on, then. Much to Jill's delight, Queenie comes over to say hello. What are you doing? You're a good girl, are you? Hey, my little baby. She was one of the more fortunate pet trade marmosets, and clearly had a good relationship with her owner. I mean, these masks don't help. Obviously, she can't see your face, but but she just knew straight away. Clearly, you guys cared about her. Oh, yeah, there was no doubt that she was going to remember you. Yeah. But after a short time, Queenie returns to her mate, Mickey. They've obviously developed a strong bond in a short time, and she's enjoying his company. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. She looks so... Content and happy. I know I made the right decision. I mean, much as we did as best for her, I knew she was lonely. I knew she needed a companion. And now she got one. It's a sentiment echoed by the care team. We obviously want them to see their animal doing well, and, and they are always doing well when they, they come to see them. Um, but obviously the owner wants some recognition. They want the marmoset to recognise them. And most of the time that does happen, um, but not always. Um, kind of sad for the owner, but it's what we want. These are monkeys and they're supposed to be with monkeys. So, um, and if they're not reacting to their own, it means they're happy and they're settled here. And that's what we really want to see. So it was nice for, for Queenie's owner to see her and interact with her, but it might not be the same next time. And, and that's to be expected and that's okay. Queenie is thriving and content with her new life. And Jill is delighted the marmoset has found a companion to share it with. Hi, she said hello and she's gone back to what her life is now. And that, that makes me feel great. Really great. Over at Hananya's enclosure, it's breakfast time for the 18 members of this established and well settled group. This morning is a pretty calm and quiet affair. Everyone's tucking into their food and, when they've had enough, enjoying the warm sunshine. Everyone, that is, except Simon. He's about 27 years old, but he's still full of fun, constantly on the go and quite the acrobat. Simon may be young at heart, 
but he's also a very astute and clever chimp. He knows exactly how the politics of chimp society work, and he's the perfect foil for Hananya, operating as his second in command. Those two boys do kind of keep things ticking along and keep everyone happy. I think if it wasn't for the size difference and generally the females just fancy Hananya a whole lot more than him, then he would probably, I think he'd be an absolutely amazing dominant male. But um, he doesn't seem to want to take over from Hananya. He doesn't challenge him in that way. It's just if, say, Hananya's having a day where he's been a bit mean, really, then Simon might try and stand up to him. But for the most part, he just keeps out the boss's way, which is usually quite wise to do. <laughs> Simon grew up with most of the group following his arrival in 1996 and lived in the chimp nursery along with Hananya, Shimak and Arthur. It's a bond that stood the test of time. But as with all chimp groups, squabbles still erupt from time to time. Often over the smallest of things. And Hananya's group are no different. They still fight, that's just chimps, so it's just how, it's how they get along. <laughs> you know, half their society is beating each other up and then the other half is kissing and making up. These guys, I would say, out of all of our chimp groups here, are probably the most dramatic. It can sometimes be the slightest little thing. But um, it's mainly just shouting at each other. You very rarely have anything serious. I think they just live for the drama sometimes, but, you know, they've got to entertain themselves somehow. <laughs> Simon and his old friend Shimak are important characters in the group. They help keep the others youthful and engaged and also play a key role in maintaining the troop's equilibrium. The park covers an area of more than 65 acres, giving the care team access to plenty of natural habitat including trees, plants and shrubs, for the benefit of the primates. In the wild, the majority of the monkeys and apes spend most of their time living in the trees. Unfortunately, at the park, the chimpanzees and orangutans made short work of the living trees in their enclosures. They had to be replaced with sturdy climbing frames and hoses. But many of the smaller primates are less destructive and enjoy the benefits of living in naturally planted enclosures. The habitat also provides shelter for all sorts of bugs and insects, perfect for squirrel monkeys, who love to hunt. This is a really nice open-topped enclosure for the squirrel monkeys to live in, and we have tried to put certain things in there because of the species that they are. So in this enclosure, we've made sure we've put a lot of plants that will attract native and wild insects, so as well as we feed them insects um, that we buy in, we also have provided them with this kind of environment so that they can catch their own wild insects and also it's really good enrichment, it's probably better enrichment than we can ever really provide for them. Uh, it's a lot more natural for them to do and it's an in a natural instinct that they can carry out. There are five squirrel monkeys in the group, three common and two black-capped, and although the species wouldn't necessarily come across each other in the wild, the five do get on very well. The troop are all very active, even Turvey, who's an older lady. Her fellow black-capped companion Nueve arrived from Chessington Zoo. But the three common squirrel monkeys had a very different life experience prior to arriving at the park. Logan, Lucille and Lopez were rescued three years ago from appalling conditions at a house in Somerset. They were in a very poor state. Lucille was emaciated, and Lopez was missing an eye. But the team at the park provided them with the right environment and diet, enabling the trio to thrive and settle into a more natural way of life. Squirrel monkeys as a species are just high energy. There are some of the primate species that are more sedate, the sarkis, for example, they sit around a bit more. Squirrel monkeys are forever on the go. We very rarely see them sat down. They do sit down and groom occasionally, but most of the time they just go, go, go all the time. Um, they eat a lot of insects. It's a high energy food because they need a lot of energy because they're so active. So it's kind of a, it's a bit of a cycle really. They need high energy food, so they want insects, but insects take high energy to catch them. So 
they had have to eat those foods to be able to keep going and stuff. But yeah, they never sit still, these guys. Hailing from the forests of Central and South America, squirrel monkeys are insectivores. The greatest proportion of their diet is made up of insects. They do eat other foods such as leaves, fruit and seeds, and even small animals. But insects packed full of calcium and other nutrients are their favourite. They often hunt by stealth. Their multifocal vision gives them great depth perception. Coupled with expert hand-eye coordination, it enables them to easily catch their prey using just their fingers. Unlike many New World primates, such as the woolly monkeys and spider monkeys, they don't have a prehensile tail. Instead, they use theirs for balance. They have incredible core strength, which allows them to reach out even when perched on the flimsiest of branches. The squirrel monkey enclosure is an ideal habitat. Its size and natural planting provides its residents with plenty of opportunity to hunt, encouraging them to exhibit natural behaviours. It's all part of the park's goal to rehabilitate so many of those in need. Keeping all the primates at the park busy and active is a top priority for the primate care staff. They're constantly looking for new ways to keep their charges interested and on the go. The park's three orangutan groups proved one of the biggest challenges. In the wild, they spend most of their time high up in the tree canopy. But captive orangs are more sedentary and, without enough exercise, can easily put on weight. They need motivation to work their bodies and muscles. Feeding time can be a problem. Breakfast is easy. It's put out before the primates are let into the enclosure. Meals later in the day are the issue. Getting the food up high when the orangutans are in the enclosure is extremely difficult. But Jeremy thinks he may have the answer. What I want is to throw food from our towers into the enclosure up to something high, um, you know, so they're going to climb up and get it. Well, that's what I'm making here. This will be like a a bowl, if you like, to gather the food. And we could do it if it works for one. And obviously, we've got to have at least two or three. Otherwise, you know, one animal's going to get all the food. Um, this is also, you know, we'll stress now. This is a prototype, like everything I make. Um, and then, you know, we can encourage them off the deck, you know, and we can throw food from a distance into this and it's big enough, you know, that it's going to catch it. Reason, I mean, you're bound to have some little miss, but then, you know, well, you know, practice makes perfect. Jeremy's experimental contraption is going to be tested on Gordon and his two ladies, Shaolan and Amy. Jeremy is particularly concerned about Amy. The objective of this primarily, entirely really, is to get orangs off the floor, particularly Amy. Amy is too fat, she's far too fat, and she needs to lose weight. And she doesn't, you know, we're trying to encourage her to climb around more. A lot of work has gone into building the bowl-shaped feeder. And a lot of thought is needed when it comes to positioning it inside the enclosure. I, I reckon you've got a good shot of getting it in there, but if you did it down here where you can definitely get it in, it's almost pointless. It has to be high enough to encourage the orangutans to climb. Six inches from the top. Yeah. We're going to use that hang the basket. Far enough away from the poles so they work to reach it. And secure enough to cope with the potential combined weight of three adults. Plus, it needs to be near enough for staff to throw the food in. At the moment, because this is what we got, I'd rather have that. So let's go for there. You've got half a chance of getting it in there, even if you lower it another five foot yeah. or something. It's a full-on team effort finding the best position. Then, with everything set, time for Jeremy's prototype to undergo its first major test. 
Shaolan leads the way and immediately spots there's something new, making straight for it. Gordon and Amy are a bit more cautious, hanging back at first. It's not just the basket that's concerning them. All the hosing in the enclosure has been replaced too. Shaolan reaches the new feeder and tucks in. Gordon decides if she can do it, so can he. Weighing in at close to 100 kilograms, he's the largest primate at the park. But that doesn't stop him moving nimbly and quickly along the apparatus to take a look. However, the big test is whether Amy will rise to the challenge. No such luck. Glued to the ground, she picks at some fallen scraps. Gordon and shaolan has been up there, and of course, the one person who's fat backside we want up there is sat on the ground waiting for the fallout, I think. She obviously knows that I'm a dreadful thrower, and the chances of me getting stuff in that is pretty remote. Come on, Amy. Get up there. There's no way. Don't give me that look. I divorced you a long time ago. It seems Amy's right. Throwing isn't Jeremy's forte. But he tries, and tries, and tries again. You know, I'm getting a bit old for all this throwing stuff about, so... It would have been nicer if it's closer, but that would have meant putting a whole load more climbing apparatus in, which maybe in the future we can do. But just to capitalise on this window, because they were in there anyway, let's get it in. Jeremy's aim improves, and when food does land in the basket, Gordon and Shaolan are enthusiastic, immediately off the ground and climbing. But Amy's not for moving. A stubborn and focused female if she doesn't want to do something, she won't. The whole thing was to get Amy more active and climbing and doing stuff. And so far, her feet haven't touched the floor, haven't left the floor. Whereas, um, as you can see, uh, Shaolan was the first up there. Mind you, she didn't come out first, and then Gordon was two seconds behind her. But that is typical of Amy. Amy will give thing a coat of looking at for quite a long time before she commits herself to it. So. I, I know her, so I'm not surprised, so... But she, I bet you she'll be up there. She, you know, temptation will get the better of her at some point. But not just yet. However, it's a work in progress. And despite needing a few tweaks here and there, Jeremy's prototype feeder has been a success and is here to stay. <laughs> Next time on Monkey Life. Worrying developments as the vets try to find out what's wrong with elderly chimp Kalu. For her medical issues to catch up with her now would just be devastating. And a new puzzle feeder proves a bit of a headache for Gibbon Delumi.